Good morning. morning. (laughs) How are you this morning? I'm so glad that you are here. What a beautiful day that the Lord has given us. Could we not have asked for a better day to gather in his house this morning to worship together? So glad that you are here this morning. Jamie is under the weather, so she won't be with us this morning. So keep her in your prayers. Uh, I'm sure she's going to be fine, but just uh, pray for her as she recovers. Uh, I, can you believe that Jerusalem is gone? The promise is over. I mean, did you enjoy the promise? Was it not just a fabulous this year? Well, you and your friends will have a chance to enjoy it again. Uh, during Holy Week, the YouTube premiere will be available for you and your friends. So make sure you let folks know it's a great way to celebrate uh, Holy Week and uh, Easter as we move towards Easter. Uh, a reminder also, our Monday Thursday service, one of the, I believe, it's one of the most moving services that we have all year long, will be the Thursday of Holy Week, that is April the 14th, at 6, six o'clock right here in the sanctuary. Uh, it's a time of communion, a time of stripping the altar and carrying the cross out front. It's a very moving service. Easter Sunday will have four services, 8.30 right here for a traditional service, 9.15 contemporary 10 o'clock back here for traditional and 11 o'clock in the contemporary. So make sure you are making your plans to be here uh, then. Uh, We have a brand new ministry opportunity that I'm excited to share with you this morning. So I invite you to turn your attention to the screens for a video with Dane Borup and myself. Hey folks, we wanna tell you about a new ministry opportunity that's available here through Park Avenue as a result of the continual training that Dane is doing through Asbury Seminary. So Dane, tell us about this opportunity. Yeah, so uh, I have been continuing, as many of you know, continuing to pursue my master's degree in pastoral counseling. And I've reached the point in that process where I'm in uh, the practicum phase, which means I'm actively counseling individuals under the supervision of a licensed marriage and family therapist. And so that means that we can now offer those services to the church for free. Um, You can meet with either myself uh, individually or you can meet with myself and Jeff Bickers who is a marriage and family therapist of over 25 years of experience. Um, He's very, very good. Uh, You can meet with us in co-counseling if you're more comfortable with that. And uh, we can offer those services to people inside and outside of the church absolutely free of charge. That's amazing. So what kind of situations would you cover with this counseling? So uh, the majority of cases that we see um, typically would be for anxiety, depression, um, marital issues, parent-child, family dynamic types of things as well as grief counseling, divorce care, those types of things are, um, are the main things we see, but there's a litany of other things that we are qualified to address as well. I think it's really important that we're able to do that through a Christian setting. And I've been really excited about the, the opportunity to have this type of ministry at Park Avenue for a number of years. I remember years ago, there was a family that was going through, the, through a divorce and uh, the church that they were attending Uh, was able to offer these kind of services and the counselor met not with the parents but went directly with the children in counseling and I thought that was really impressive to help the children deal with the divorce their parents were going through. Yeah that's 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 very crucial um, in those very difficult times when people are are in that process uh, that the children receive support Uh, and so we can offer that type of divorce care for children um, as well as for the adults at the same time and, and really try to bring in support, provide helpful resources and those types of things and try to help get them through that painful process. So if someone wanted to take advantage of this free opportunity, this new ministry that we have here at Park Avenue, h- how would they get uh, in contact with you and they, set it up? They can just reach out to me uh, through my email at daneboroff at paumc.com uh, or if they uh, better with the telephone, they can call the church office and leave a message for me and I'll get back with them promptly. We can set up a time for an appointment or if they just wanna have a phone call to get a little bit more information on the process and details what that looks like, that type of thing, um, I'm, I'm open to any of that. They just give me an email, give me a call and I'll get back with you. And of course, it's 100% confidential. 100% confidential, nothing that is said leaves that room that's very, very important uh, to the counseling relationship and process. 
uh, that they understand that anything that is said within the walls of that room, I am legally obligated to keep confidential. And so there's, there's no way anything could ever leave there. Yeah, that's really important. So when does this start? Uh, this starts immediately. They can, they can call this afternoon if they'd like. They can shoot me an email and I'll get back with them. Well, we're grateful for the training you continue uh, to engage in right now and for this opportunity to bring this ministry to fruition here at Park Avenue. So if you're interested, contact Dane. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. So it's a free service. So if you or someone you know needs to uh, maybe receive a little counseling, there's a great opportunity, a new ministry here at Park Avenue we're excited about. Today is Communion Sunday. So if you're not comfortable receiving communion by intinction, we'll have available for you the prepackaged elements uh, for uh, the communion. So we're glad you were here this morning. Be sure you fill out your communication card. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Let me pray for us and we'll continue to worship. Father, thank you for a beautiful day, a day we can gather in your house to celebrate your presence among us. We want to move closer to you even today. So God, draw near to us and we'll draw near to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now stand and greet those around you as we continue to worship.
and my strength and the strength of my life. Hopefully that got you ready to sing this morning. But before we do, I want to thank Lane Bellinger for playing our pre-service music this morning. Gunner is not under the weather. He's on a school trip. You know, he's teaching school in Waycross, and this was their weekend for their school trip. So he's in Nashville hanging out with high school kids. Fun, fun. I did that for 30 years myself. I know exactly what that's like. And we also thank Reese Nelson for uh, playing the organ today. So, you know, it takes a village to do all this. So we're thankful for our village. We are going to sing, Come Thou Almighty King, help us thy name to sing. It's your turn to sing. So let's stand as we sing this morning. Join me please in this affirmation of faith from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and then to, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. prepare our hearts now for our time of Holy Communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. 
Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. We are always grateful for your sacrificial love that you share with our church to allow us to have the ministries that we are able to have here at Park Avenue. So thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, there will be a, a slide up on the screen to remind you of how you can give. And as always, your uh, gifts are, are you're available to give your offering on your way out in the offering plates and to drop your communication card in there as well. And uh, children, if there are children here, you're welcome to go to Children's Church uh, now. Oh 
And at the end of my heart's testing, with your likeness, let me Absolutely beautiful. You know, there's just so much power in being close to Christ. And there's, that's where we're working right now is uh, through this series called Closer. And I wonder uh, if you have friends who just don't get the fact that you want to be closer to Christ. Or, or maybe you have family members who just, quite, uh, just can't quite understand why you have this affinity for Christ and why it is that you want to be close to him. You know, they're, they're good people around us, obviously. I mean, they, 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 surely they've heard of Jesus by now. They know the stories. They've heard them. And, and they probably even bow their heads when there's a prayer shared in your midst. But they just don't get who Jesus is yet for, for whatever reason. They, they don't get what he's all about. They don't understand how his life impacts our life. Do you know people like that? You know, some, some people who've been around the church most of their life really don't get exactly who Jesus is. In today's passage, in today's scripture, uh, Jesus is in the midst of a lot of people. He's in the synagogue, we'll see. And there are a lot of people who are drawing close to him for different reasons. And, and there's a man that he notices in their midst that has a deformed hand. Jesus doesn't ignore the man. He sees him, the scripture will tell us, and he heals him on the Sabbath. The very thing that the Pharisees who were in the room as well were hoping he would do so that they could catch him and arrest him for breaking the law. So our scripture comes from Mark chapter 3. If you've got your Bibles, turn there. Mark chapter 3, 6 verses 1 through 6. We'll uh, stand as we honor God's word uh, this morning. Mark chapter 3, Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. Notice the word closely. If he, had healed the man's, if he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? If this, is this a day to save life or to destroy it? But they wouldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored at once, the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated if you would. So these Pharisees, these religious leaders, they show up at the synagogue, of course, and they want to get close to Jesus, but not for the right reason. They want to get close to Jesus so they can spy on him. They were hoping that he would break what they understood to be the rabbinic law, which says that you can't do healings unless, or, or help someone who is, who is sick on the Sabbath unless it is a life-threatening problem. But that's exactly what Jesus does. He heals this man even though his deformed hand was not a life-threatening uh, issue. You know, you would think, you and I would think, because we see the whole story, we would look back on it and we would think, these religious leaders, they sure ought to understand, they should have understood who Jesus is. They should get him. They should know what he was about. I mean, they'd been expecting the Messiah, and here he is now in their midst. 
But here's what I take away from today's lesson in part. You can be really close to Jesus, but still miss who he is. Isn't it true? You you can be so close to him uh, like these Pharisees were and others were. So many people were following him throughout his life, but not all of them got who he is. It's interesting. You can hang out with him. You can eat with him. You can listen to him. You can even follow him. Still not get who he is or what he's all about. It's true. So, so Jesus, in, in the midst of this, in the synagogue, sees this man with this deformed hand. And, and I just love the fact that what he does with the man, he calls him to center stage. You know what that is? Just has him stand up in front of everyone. He wants everybody there to see what he is about to do, especially the Pharisees, the religious leaders, who don't yet seem to get who he is. I, I don't know... Uh, if you've ever been at center stage before or not, I remember in high school, we had a, a high school teacher, Mr. Arlen Woody. He taught us uh, uh, geometry, and, uh, and he, uh, he, he would put us uh, to, the, to the chalkboard and, and lay out a, a problem for us, and we would have to figure it out. Did you have a teacher that ever did that? And if you didn't figure it out, you would have to come back until you figured it out. You would stand at that board in front of everybody in the classroom until you figured out the problem. Now, one thing he did do, he taught us what we needed to learn, didn't he? For, most, for the most part. I mean, being center stage, Jesus has this man in front of everybody. He wants them to see what he's about to do. And for whose benefit? Was it for the man's benefit who had the deformed hand? Was it for the religious leader's benefit? Was it for our benefit today? Because here's, here's the reality. When, when Jesus uh, calls us to the center stage, he's not trying to hide what's about to happen. In fact, he never hides what he wants to show to us. He, he, he doesn't uh, masquerade what he's about to do. Instead, he does it out in the middle of the synagogue with everyone watching. Why is that? It's because he knows that what he's about to show us is an important lesson. And it's for our good if we'll receive it. So he never hides it. He never hides what he wants to show us and he never hides what he wants to call out in us too. Have you ever noticed that in your life, in your walk with Jesus? Have you ever noticed that he doesn't hide the fact when he says to you in your spirit, he says, he says you need to go make this right. You, you need to go apologize to this person that you've hurt. Uh, you, you need to forgive. Listen, you need to believe me. Has God ever called you out? Has he ever called you to the center of the room? You know, Jesus knew what was racing through this, these religious leaders' minds. He, he knew what they were thinking. And, and so he asked them a question in front of everybody. Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? And, and it's really an interesting uh, statement that he, or question that he asked but because what he was intending to do was good. And he's saying, can you do good on the Sabbath? But he also was pointing out the fact that he knew what these religious leaders were up to. The fact that they were spying on him. They were looking for a way to catch him and put him to death, to kill. And they were using the Sabbath for that purpose, hoping he would violate the law. So the Pharisees were silent, refusing to answer Jesus, it said, because they couldn't answer him. They would indict themselves if they did. But you noticed Jesus' reaction, did you? It says that Jesus looked around at his critics angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Uh, deeply saddened and angry because of their hearts, the condition of their hearts. I mean, um, I, I looked at this, this phrase, hardened heart, and I, I began to wonder, uh, well, what is a hardened heart and what causes it? What does it look like? And how do we know whether we might have a hardened heart or our friends might? And so I look, looked up the word hardened. Here's what it means. Hardened uh, means to, to be made or become hard or harder. It means pitiless, unfeeling. Firmly established and unlikely to change like a hardened criminal. 
You can imagine a heart like that, pitiless, unfeeling, hard like stone, you might say, a hardened heart. You know, obviously the heart is the, it's the central organ of the body. It's literally pumping life into us, isn't it, every moment. But there's a spiritual heart too. There's a spiritual side of our hearts, and it's just as important, if not even more so. In Proverbs, here's what we're told about the hardened heart. It says, blessed is the man who always fears, trusts God, believes in God, respects in awe who God is, but one who hardens his heart falls into trouble. And I read that and I think, okay, well, Jimmy, it's suggesting that we can harden our own hearts. That it's not something that is done to us. It's something that we do that affects the way our hearts are. And, and so the condition of our heart is essential. I, I've, I've taught us in the past as we were looking at the core values. and I mean, Jesus is always after our heart. He wants to know that our hearts are in the right condition. Where faith takes root in our hearts. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we're taught, we're taught this. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, faith is there. It doesn't say believe in your mind, believe intellectually. It says in your heart, which was the center of the emotions for all of us. The heart is central to our salvation. It is because that's where our faith, it's where our belief resides. And so Jesus is always after the heart, and he's saddened by these hard hearts that he sees in the company around him. But unbelievers, they're not the only ones who can have a hardened heart. In fact, uh, believers, you and I are at risk of this as well. There's an interesting moment in the gospel accounts where Jesus calls out the disciples for having what he says is a hardened heart. It, it was when they were in the boat and they were going across the sea and as they were doing so they were talking about the fact that they didn't bring enough bread with them and Jesus begins to teach them and then all of a sudden uh, he says something to them that probably shocked them in verse uh, Mark 8 verse 17 it says Jesus knew what they were saying so he said why are you arguing about having no bread don't you know or understand even yet are your hearts look at that too hard to take it in you have eyes, you, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all that he had been teaching them? So if the disciples who were really close to Jesus struggled at times with what appeared to be a hard heart, then we shouldn't think that we're exempt from that condition either. You know, hard-hearted people are typically the way they are because of something that's happened in their life. In their past, maybe they've They've had an experience that leaves them with a, a broken heart. I don't know exactly what causes it at all, but I do believe this is true. The hardest thing about a hard-hearted person is that they're usually the last to know it. They're the last ones. I think that's why Jesus calls out the disciples. He's saying, watch your hearts, guys. Watch your hearts. So how do we know? if our hearts are hardened, whether we're a believer or an unbeliever, how might we know that? Well, I ran across a list of some signs of a hard-hearted heart, a hardened heart. And, and here's, here's the first one that I saw. It's on the back of your sermon notes. You can look up these passages of Scripture later. The first was this. It's a lack of understanding. I, I think that's where these Pharisees were the religious leaders standing in the synagogue with Jesus as he's teaching it's just like they, they have a lack of understanding and by, because of that their hearts are hard they, they can't receive who Jesus is it's a lack of understanding and there are probably many among us who have that same lack of understanding now there are other signs look at this one sign of bitterness and resentment here's where probably something happened in our past and we're still bitter about it we still resent what happened to us or what was done to us or, or maybe it's a, a resentment we have for something we've done but that can lead to the hardening of our hearts 
when we find ourselves there. In Ephesians, Paul will tell us, if you look at that passage, he'll say, get rid of it. Get rid of all the bitterness. Be kind to one another. Get rid of the rage and anger, he'll say, so that your heart doesn't remain hardened. Another one that uh, is a sign of a hardened heart is this. It's isolation from God and from others. You can go back and look at the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4 and, and how uh, Cain was, was trying to isolate himself and would be isolated from others. And, and that can cause the hardened heart. Maybe it's because we've been hurt before in a relationship or maybe it's because God didn't come through when we wanted him to. And so all of a sudden we find ourselves hurt and we back away and wall others off and wall ourselves off from God. Isolation from God and others is a sign of a hardened heart. There's another one I mentioned a minute ago, and that's the refusal to forgive. If, if we are hearing God call us out and say to us, hey, you need to forgive this person. You need to go to them and ask them to forgive you, but you need to forgive as well. And if we don't, the result is that heart becomes hard. It just does over time. It hardens. You can read what Matthew has to say about that. There's another one. You'll know this one. It's just indifference. It's just, I, I just don't care anymore. I, I don't care that, that, that God sent Jesus. I just don't care. Or, or, or we just, for whatever reason, have now just decided that it's not that important. And oh, well. Well, we know what Revelation says. You know the passage probably by heart. It's the lukewarm passage. Oh, I wish that you were either hot or cold, but you're neither. And because you're a lukewarm, I spit you out of my mouth. Jesus saying that. If you find yourself being indifferent, you're probably in danger of having a hardened heart. There are others. Number six is this. It's pride. It's just that I'm too proud. I, I, I can handle this life myself. I don't need Jesus in my life. I've got, I've got the strength within my own ability to live through this life. And I've done pretty well so far, so why do I need him? Well, listen, that's pride. It's absolute pride. And Jeremiah talks about that and the impact that it has on your heart when we are prideful. But there, there are two others. The, the number seven one was this. It's, it's failure to listen. And, and you can see listen means obey there. It's the failure to listen, to obey God. When God speaks to us those words, when he calls us out to center stage and says, listen, here's what you need to do. I want everybody to see you. You're in the center stage now. Here's what you need to do. I, I, I wanted to read to you Psalm 95 because it's st it stayed with me uh, when I was studying it recently. Look what it says there in 7. It says, if you would only listen to his voice today. The psalmist is saying, we need to listen to what the Lord says. Look what it says. The Lord says, don't harden your hearts as Israel did at Meribah and as they did at Massa in the wilderness. That's when they complained against Moses for leading them out into the wilderness. They didn't have any food. They didn't have any water. For, then, for there, your ancestors tested and tried my patience, the Lord is saying. Even though they saw everything he had done, he'd already parted the Red Sea. He'd already showed them the ten plagues. For 40 years, I was angry with them, the Lord says. And I said, they are my people, look what it says, whose hearts turned away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. And we know that generation did not enter the promised land, which was to be the place of rest. Failure to listen, to obey. Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel speaks to that as well. And, and it's in chapter 3. Look what it says there. It says, God speaking to Ezekiel, sending him to the people, says, No, I'm not sending you to people with strange and difficult speech. I'm not sending you to people that can't understand you. Uh, if I did that, they would listen. But the people of Israel won't listen to you, he says, any more than they listen to me, for the whole lot of them are hard-hearted and stubborn. Failure to listen to God, failure to obey God, results in a hard-hearted heart. Well, one more, unrepented 
hearts, unrepentant hearts. In, in Romans uh, chapter 2, you can read about the failure to turn from our sins, confess, and be repentant of the sin in our life. Because a hardened heart, once we find ourselves there, it can become more and more obstinate and unresponsive to the truth. That's what happens when we get a hardened heart. It just seems to spiral and thicken in its hardness. And so in many cases, there's bitterness that takes root and, and eventually that hardness just settles in and we become untrusting and isolated and hiding as best we can what's really going on in our hearts. So what's the solution? How can we avoid having a hardened heart, you and I? Well, here's the beauty of the story of God. God can heal any heart. I, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I've had people in my ministry have come to me and they have absolutely been brokenhearted. So, so much so that they couldn't lift their heads up. So, so much so that they were depressed and, and isolated and lonely and they felt like there was absolutely no hope for them. Their heart was broken. And I've watched God heal it. I've watched God love them into a healthy heart. He can heal any heart, broken, hurting, troubled, even hardened hearts. And God will show us the condition of our hearts if we'll ask him. The psalmist said it this way. The psalmist said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Point out anything in me that is offensive to you and lead me on the path of everlasting life. So ask him. If you're not sure where your heart is, ask him to show you. And then do this. Ask Jesus to soften it. To soften it. In the Old Testament, in the book of Hosea, it says this. It says, I said, plant the good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts. For now is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. Plow up the hard ground. Ask him to soften your heart. And we're told in, in Hebrews chapter 3 that we are to remember what the scripture says. That passage I read to you a moment ago from, from the Psalms, Psalm 95, says this, Today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. So let me give you a couple of action steps for this week. If you, if you sense that your heart might be starting to harden, here, here's the first one. You, you need to fight through your feelings. Fight through your feelings. Here's what I mean. There, there are times, there are seasons in our lives when we're supposed to, what is supposed to be meaningful and uh, supposed to be impactful becomes it feels mechanical. Do you know what I mean? I, I think that's part of the problems, problem with the Pharisees. Their religion for them had become more mechanical than it had meaningful. And sometimes for us that happens. And, and so here, here's the instruction then. D do it anyway. Still go through the motions. Go, go to work. Kiss your spouse. Hang out with your kids. Read your Bible. Pray. Even if you don't feel like your prayers are being heard, you feel like you're just talking to the ceiling. Fight through your feelings. Just because you don't feel like it's real doesn't mean it isn't real. Eventually, your emotions will catch up. Your emotions will catch up to your obedience if you're faithful to it. And here's, here's the second action step. Decide to trust again. Decide to trust again. It's a huge one. It's important to consciously re-engage your heart and to trust people again. You can trust people again. Someone may have hurt you in the past, but not everyone will in the future. You, you have to be vulnerable to do this again, and you have to trust again. And that's what God continues to do with us. And Jesus did it on the cross. And then here's the third one. Just don't wall yourself off from others or yourself. Just don't do it. You know, community is a big piece of the solution. You, you will want to be alone when you're in this place, but don't. Don't do it. Solitude 
is used by God for good. But isolation is used by the enemy. So you still talk to God or you talk to a friend or a mentor. And, and yes, sometimes you, you even need to, to see a counselor. And that's why I'm so excited about this new opportunity we talked about uh, with Dane in the uh, announcements this morning. So Jesus called him out. And it saddened him that their hearts, their hearts were hard. But Jesus died for hard hearts too, you know. He, he pushed through his own feelings when he desired that the cup be lifted from him. He completely trusted the Father all the way to that last breath on the cross. And he chose the cross so that you and I can believe in our hearts and be saved today we remember what he did for us as we celebrate holy communion together would you join me in the great thanksgiving The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he broke it, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for others. As often as you do this, drink this, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Will those who are going to assist come now to receive?
que te dejó en el suelo.
are going to stand and sing the last verse of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. You know, it's a hard verse to sing because it says it demands my heart and it demands my soul and it demands my all to be a follower of Christ. Let's stand and sing. being close to Jesus can be dangerous because he calls us to new places. I'm so grateful that he does that because we all need it. I'm grateful that you were here this morning. May God bless you all this week. We'll see you next week. Love you. Go in peace. Amen.